really happy uh, to have the opportunity also in the second edition to, uh, to have a conversation with uh, uh, Kevin Moloney. Uh, that was uh, one of our guests from uh, uh, last year. Hi, Karen, how do you do? There is a problem with your microphone. How's that? Yeah, that's <laughs> much better. Hi. <laughs> how are you, Dr. John Jeff? Ah, oh, I'm fine. I just Good. want to present you again to our audience also this year because uh, Kevin Moloney is an assistant professor in the Center for Emerging Media Design and Development at the Department of Journalism at the Ball State University. And he's a transmedia scholar. And so he teaches transmedia storytelling, design thinking, and project-based immersive learning courses. So something that we also mention uh, uh, during uh, our morning. Uh, but also, Kevin uh, is a uh, consults with public and private organization uh, on transmedia story design. And uh, so, uh, also prior to entering the academy, Kevin was a photojournalist for the New York Times, uh, covering a broad range of critical issues uh, worldwide. Uh, but I'm really, really happy because uh, uh, today, Kevin is here for leading with me uh, the conversation with Matt. So I'd like that Kevin can introduce me. Hi, Matt. <laughs> Hey, good morning. <laughs> good morning. Uh, well, in introduction, Matt Slaby, a former student of mine from the University of Colorado, has worn many hats. So he's been a wildland firefighter, a paramedic, a photojournalist, and he's a trained lawyer. Currently, he is co-owner of Luceo, a media production company that designs complex, socially concerned transmedia stories. Luceo enacts intuitive forms of empathy research and human-centered design in the stories they build. Most notably, the company designs story campaigns to humanize the opioid abuse crisis in the United States, where as many as 81,000 people die each year from opioid overdoses. So thanks for joining us, Matt, and letting me reel you into this. Well, I'm pleased to be here. Um, good morning to everybody and good evening. I understand we're in all parts of the world, so good to be here. <laughs> well, first, um, I know that this is a subject that you've encountered in a lot of those careers I, that I just mentioned. Can you can you tell us a little bit about how you have entered this world of the opioid abuse crisis and, and how your own engagement with it has evolved? Yeah, no, I mean, I entered it um, backwards. So my first experience with uh, opioid use and opioid overdose was when I was an 18 year old EMT and I was you know, training in the field. Um, I was working with a paramedic who, uh, you know, more or less, I, I think set the example and, and showed me the quote unquote ropes for how you're supposed to behave around this stuff. And I, I say suppose or supposed to in quotations because it, you know, it wasn't really the best example. <laughs> But the very first overdose that I saw was a, a young man who was about my age, who lived in an apartment building where a number of people that I knew lived. Um, in fact, people that I worked with lived in the complex, uh, dressed like me, looked like me, apartment was clean, neat, uh, and, and he had overdosed on, on heroin. Um, and so my, my first recollection, the very first thing that I saw is, um, the the paramedic who was training me berating uh, the young man. So just to give an example of how an overdose works and then um, to what the response is to an overdose. Uh, overdose is basically just of a person who stops breathing. You know, and when, when you stop breathing, eventually your heart stops beating and that's, that's ultimately what kills you. So by taking too many opioids, those opioids fill the receptors in your brain. They, they suppress your respiratory drive. Uh, and eventually your, your heart stops beating. The, the response to an overdose is elegant. It's really simple. Uh, there's a drug called naloxone, which has a higher affinity for those receptors in your brain, which means that it pushes the opioids out of the brain receptor and it takes the place where the opioid should be, uh, which returns a person to consciousness uh, fast. It's not a, it's not a minutes or, or hours sort of an event. It's, it's, a, it's usually a seconds kind of an event. So the young man received uh, naloxone uh, and he was awake fast and the paramedic, you know, was, was in his face, you know, shouting at him, I bet you're upset that I took away your, your $10 high. Um, 
and, and you know that that set the tone for for me for for many years. You know, my experiences with people that were overdosing was was and people that were subjected to um, uh, uh, the stuff was um, was dark. <laughs> it was. It wasn't, wasn't something that it was pleasant. It wasn't something that I wanted to be near. It wasn't something that I had a lot of empathy for. It was highly stigmatized, and those people were supposed to be other than me. Um, but as I said, you know, I identified with that young man. I, 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 he looked like people that I knew. He looked like me. Um, he lived in a place where I knew people, and he certainly wasn't other. Uh, over over time, um, as a journalist, I became involved with uh, the overdose crisis by being connected with a harm reduction uh, facility in Denver, Colorado. And I was connected by a friend who wanted me to become aware of uh, underground syringe uh, access, syringe needle exchange is, is what people normally know it as, uh, that was happening in, in Denver. And I went as a skeptic. I thought, you know, I don't really believe in this stuff. I believe that giving people needles is probably uh, enables their drug use, probably makes this crisis more complicated than it needs to be. I, I don't, I'm not on board just based on what I'd seen in the past. Uh, and, and, you know, my opinion changed rapidly. Uh, it's, it's something that I'm a, a wholehearted supporter of now. And there's a few reasons for that. There's three things that, that uh, harm reduction programs can control that the status quo can't control. So the first thing is rates of hepatitis C. In Denver, where I'm sitting right now, about three and four people who inject drugs have hepatitis C. It's a bloodborne pathogen uh, that's easily transmissible uh, when you share syringes. Um, HIV, the statistics are less dire here, uh, but you know, and it's one in 10, you know, somewhere sub 10% uh, people who inject drugs also have HIV, which is also transmissible through a 10 cent syringe and, and overdoses. So these things are, these three things are, are near perfectly preventable with basic changes to how public health is administered to people. Those three statistics floored me. Uh, they, they made me see that there was an epidemic that was happening and simply because we didn't care about the people or we were willing to discard the people at the bottom of, of you know, the people at the bottom that are receiving uh, these harms, we were also willing to live with those side effects. And that was something that, uh, you know, as a human being, I, I found uh, difficult to stomach. So, you know, in the wake of this discovery about how this crisis works, can you tell us a little bit about the stories that you're designing now to help mitigate it and for whom you're creating those stories? So most of the work that we do now uh, is campaign based and, and it's built around removing stigma from the issues of opioid use and from overdose, uh, which means that we want to humanize people that use drugs, people that work with people who use drugs. And we want people to see those people uh, as their brothers, sisters, sons, daughters, mothers, fathers, because it's actually who they are. Uh, so when when we start uh, any any work that we do, whether we're talking to uh, politicians, whether we're talking to public health providers, if we're talking to the general public, really the very first thing that, that, that we want people to do is to recognize that the, the people that they're talking about, the people that they're legislating about, um, the people that perhaps they're implementing a public health policy around uh, are not unidentifiable. Uh, they're, they're folks that they know. And by, by making people identifiable and by making people's stories um, accessible, uh, we, we sort of, we, we cross that first hurdle, um, which is to say, if you can identify the person, then maybe you'll, you'll care about it a little bit more. It, which, which for me, you know, back to the original story, the very first overdose that I saw was absolutely the case. You know, it was, it was hard for me to, to stomach uh, the way that the young man was treated only because I recognized him. So, you know, as you're, I mean, that's fascinating that your own personal experiences helped you like recreate the way we think about overdose victims and the way we think about drug users. So in the process of designing the stories that you're creating, how do you engage with, you know, experts like scientists or policymakers, but also the one that interests me the most is how are you engaging the family members of those overdose victims and the overdose victims themselves before you ever start designing the stories? 
so this is this is where you know I, I we we share experience you know uh, um working as as a journalist uh, requires you to be uh, empathetic with people and to approach people in a way that's that's non-judgmental uh, and the reason for for doing that is because you you really do want to hear somebody's story and their subjective take on the particular story so you know, just just like any subject, uh, you start out as an outsider and you rapidly become an insider if you if you truly are uh, empathetic, if you're if you're a good listener, uh, and if you're good at you know trying to understand the circumstances surrounding somebody else's decision that might be different than yours. So very early on, uh, you know, when I when I started. Uh, the first, the first, the very first work that I did was was a story on um, overdose, hepatitis C, and HIV in Denver among injection drug users. Uh, the people that I was working with were skeptical of me, and likewise, I was skeptical of them. And you know that took that took some real time to to develop a rapport um, with um, those folks. Over time, a number of those people have become, you know, uh, folks that are my friends, uh, people that are in my phone, people that are in my contact list, uh, people that I've stayed in touch with for more than a decade, and, and you know, doors more or less open um, because of that. Okay, so thank you. And also, uh, another thing that um, while you were talking, I was thinking is that. Uh, um, the role of us as designer and uh, storytellers and writers and photographers it is uh, because this is something that uh, also you uh, explain in the statement uh, uh, because uh, uh, you said that our work is uh, um, amplify and if I can add is also uh, give voices uh, to people that are directly affected uh, by the policies and practices that are at issue. So, uh, according to this, uh, um, what do you think uh, is the role of empathy in the story design process? And also another thing that uh, I started reflecting about yesterday, because I'm involved uh, in, a, in a project in which we're working with inmates. And so uh, I spent the last two days uh, in prison talking with people and uh, uh, sometimes uh, I was wondering, okay, how can we as designers, storytellers can, I don't know, what is our role and how can we interact with these people? Hmm. Um, you know, I think that the framing starts, you know, very simply, which is uh, my, my interest is, is in making the world a better place and, and it was before I got here, and that's a that's a that's a bold thing to say, and maybe something that uh, I have little or no control over whether or not that gets accomplished. But it's what I believe, and it's what I would like to do. Um, and so, you know, we, we're at this strange point in history right now, where where we're actually allowing people who's who've lived through certain things to also have um, some say in in what happens to them moving forward. Uh, you know, a number of social movements have, have centered people with lived experience, you know, inside of those movements. And, and among people that use drugs uh, or among uh, people who are incarcerated, uh, you know, it's the same there too. Uh, there's, there's, there's no reason why we, I suppose if we look at, if we take incarceration as, a, as an example, if we look at, uh, Here's some statistics that I think are really interesting. In the city of New York, if you are um, incarcerated, if you're arrested, say for jumping a turnstile in the subway, and you're jailed in Rikers Island, odds are that the, that the judge who's hearing your case will set bail according to what the prosecutor tells the judge to set the bail at, which for many people is, is exceeds the amount of money that they can pay. So functionally, that means that that person sits in jail for a period of months between when they're arrested and then when they're tried, when they're found guilty or not guilty. So in theory and in practice, um, innocent people sit in jail while they're waiting for trial because they can't pay bail. The statistic of that is really dire. If you are incarcerated ahead of your trial, you're 34% more likely 
uh, to be found guilty. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're 34% more guilty. It just means that you're 34% more likely to accept a plea bargain, uh, to not have access to your attorneys, to not have access to good legal counsel uh, ahead of time. So those are the statistics on the ground. And so my question to, to people when we think about stuff like that is, who should we listen to uh, when we talk about this issue? Should we listen? Should the judge be the, the person who is the final uh, voice uh, on that issue? Should it be the prosecutor? Or should we also listen to the, the, the people who are incarcerated, their families who potentially lost the breadwinners and the families, the children who lost their mothers and fathers? You know, those are those are also voices that are important. Um, and so I, I think that, you know, when we talk about empathy, that's, that's really what it means. It means listening to people that are impacted by the policies that we've set out. So, you know, uh, speaking of empathy and thinking about the way that the opioid crisis or other drug crises have been represented by photojournalists for decades, I'm going to show a few pictures here now to the control room um, that will, you know, demonstrate a little bit about what we see when we normally look at uh, at how, you know, images are represented of the opioid crisis. Can you guys pop those up for me? Perfect. So uh, this is a comparison, not only of the way we've classically looked at the opioid crisis as photojournalists, but how Matt and Luceo are looking at it differently. Starting with Bill Epridge in 1965 for Life Magazine and looking at the exoticism, the uh, high drama of, you know, drug crises and drug problems. On to Larry Clark, another notable photographer who in 1971 documented his crazy world of friends in Tulsa, Oklahoma, who were using heroin and other drugs and shooting each other with great frequency. But for the average American, these are very exotic pictures. It even moved into the 1980s and 90s with Eugene Richards, who documented the drug crisis then. And then even just this year, a uh, very famous photojournalist, James Noctway, uh, also photographed this opioid crisis, ex the exact one that you're dealing with, Matt. But here's the difference between their pictures and the way Luceo is approaching this. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, but these are images that were on display at the UN in Vienna a few years ago, where you can see how you have been working to humanize these subjects and some other representations of this, of the sites where opioid overdoses have happened, the surviving family members they might leave behind. So can you talk a little bit about how you are trying to upend the way we traditionally visually represent this problem through these examples? Yeah, so I, I think good context for this would be to you know, Dr. Carl Hart uh, at Columbia um, has written about his own drug use and the drug use of others for, for many years. He's a neuroscientist um, uh, at, at the university. And, you know, recently he, he said something uh, that I thought was really compelling. And he said that, you know, I'd like people to contend with one simple fact. And the fact is, is the majority of people that are using drugs are white uh, and they're middle class. Uh, and what he what he's saying in the subtext of that is, is that they're quote unquote normalized. They're people that you identify with. And so therefore you don't think of them as other. Um, the challenges of photojournalism, I, I think, uh, especially when it comes to this particular issue and some other issues as well, is, is that the more marginalized you are, the less you have to lose, the easier access is, and perhaps the more exotic uh, the images you know, you're taking are. So inside of photojournalism, we've set a, a, what I think is a, a low bar. Um, and that low bar is, is that access is king. That, you know, if you have access to something, that that's the, that's the most important thing that you can possibly have. And that's, uh, I'll speak personally, that's really appealing um, when you're young. You want to learn about the world. You want to see things that are different. Uh, 
you know, that that's, I think, a lot of the reasons that, that people get into photojournalism and journalism in, in general is you want to you want to be as close as you can to something that you don't understand. So it's understandable why people want to portray things that way. What is challenging to me is, is the harms that come from those types of portrayals. So that's to say that when policymakers, public health officials and the general public that puts pressure on them as constituents, sees this issue as something that's absolutely unidentifiable, absolutely foreign, only sees people at their worst possible moment. Um, the, you know, those are the memorable images anyway, that we're very willing to throw, uh, to throw people away. And that's had really dire consequences, both in the United States and worldwide. So last year alone, 81,000 people died of, of drug overdoses in the United States. You know, if you were to look at this as uh, like just as a big statistic over, over say, a two decade period of time, you'd be talking about, you know, a 747 crash at full 747 crashing into the ground every three days. So just think about that, a full 747 crashing into the ground every three days. If that was tied to somebody's beer use, right? You're, you're using beer uh, as your drug and you're sharing a beer glass. And the, the, the death toll was that high. We would solve this problem today. We would fix it immediately. But because it's something that's stigmatized, because the type of drug and the manner in which that drug is being used is something that's different, we're, we're, we're very unwilling to, to move in a, in a good direction. And I, I think that a lot of that has to do again, with just how we think about and portray this issue. So the work that we do and the stuff that's important to us is to show um, people as people, you know, not, not, not necessarily in their best moments, not necessarily in the worst moments, but to allow people to speak about their the circumstances uh, of their stories in a way that's relatable. So of the pictures that you showed, one of them was in the, the, the um, Commission on Narcotic Drugs, which happens every other year in Vienna. And so there's a number of, of state actors that show up and they produce a white paper at the end of it, which may or may not have uh, effect on global drug policy. But there's an anecdote from that event that I think is really compelling. Um, when you go to the Commission on Narcotic Drugs, there's all kinds of states that are there, the United States, uh, European nations, uh, Russia, um, and then, you know, some states that we think of as having some really challenging policies when it comes to drugs, uh, Singapore, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, Malaysia, countries that execute people for drug use, countries that execute people for uh, drug selling. Um, and, and oftentimes they can't really distinguish between the two. So in Saudi Arabia, they will cut your head off if you traffic drugs or deal drugs or in some cases use drugs in, in the country. Saudi Arabia shows up at the commission. They set up a big tent and at least the years that I've been, they set up a big tent in the atrium and they um, serve figs and tea. Uh, and you can go and you can look at a number of different posters that show um, masked soldiers standing over drug shipments that they've interdict interdicted in, in that country. Every year they show the same pictures of masked soldiers standing over drugs that they've interdicted in the country. The consequence for that is cutting your head off. Drugs continue to flow into the country. Nothing changes on the ground level, which it, to me is the absolute definition of insanity. You know, we are, we are proposing policy solutions to something that gets no answer. The drugs sell themselves. And so we're left with a choice of, are we just going to continue um, allowing people to overdose, allowing people to die, or, um, uh, or are we willing to make some changes to how we implement uh, policy to make this better? So what, the work that we do, and, you know, forgive me, I, I kind of walked over the, the uh uh, the actual definition of, of, of the work that we do. We, we, we work primarily with, with harm reduction organizations. So harm reduction is this very simple idea. It's, it's simple, it's elegant, it's, it's nice. It says that there's certain things that we can prevent and we should prevent them. So an example of harm reduction for everybody that's listening is wearing your seatbelt when you get into a car. You know that when you get into a car, that's an inherently dangerous thing to be doing. You know that when you get into the car, you or other people might also be breaking the law. 
um, I speed and my traffic, you know, my traffic uh, ticket list is, is uh, long. <laughs> I, w- I wear my seatbelt because I hope, I hope uh, that in the event that something bad happens that I can mitigate uh, the harms that come from that because the people that care about me, um, you know, want to see me tomorrow. And maybe there's, maybe there's some opportunities for me um, that I haven't fully realized. Harm reduction says the same thing. So it works with people who use drugs. It finds people that use drugs on the spectrum of their drug use, somewhere between total chaotic use and total abstinence. There's this middle ground that we just don't address, we never talk about, which is people that are gonna use drugs today and tomorrow. And so the questions that harm reduction asks is what can we do to work with those people uh, to improve their lives and also the, the broader question of public health uh, that we're not doing right now. So a 10 cent syringe will stop the transmission of hepatitis C. Hepatitis C has, has, a, has a public health cost of eighty to $90,000 for treatment, a lifetime treatment for that person. So a 10 cent syringe or the eighty to $90,000 tab. HIV is the same way, except HIV has a lifetime treatment tab of about a half million dollars. Uh, when somebody dies, just as when somebody's incarcerated, uh, you've you've removed people from family networks, from social networks that that made those networks viable in a lot of ways. Uh, and so, you know, the, the focus is really about what can we do today? What small change can we make today that'll improve your life? And so, harm reduction, rather than being this like black or white question of chaotic use or not chaotic use, um, is uh, uh, really a question of what small change can we make today? And are those, are those changes cumulative in effect? Um, you had mentioned, you know, when we were talking the other day about, uh, you know, we had talked a little bit about the idea of you as a translator. And that intrigues me with a lot of what you were just addressing in describing harm reduction, that you are, you are making simple ideas clearer for other people perhaps, but I would like you to describe how you think of yourself as a translator, particularly in designing stories for public safety. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, I think translation is a really nice nice way to put it. Um, you know, translator and also, uh, you know, amplifier, because again, you know, my particular story is not necessarily the thing that um, needs to be put front and center. It is the story of other people. Um, so when, when I think about this challenge, you know, we, we think about the audience that we're trying to reach um, and what the values of that audience is. So when we talk about harm reduction, you know, there's a number of different frames that we can uh, take with that. You know, in, for, for me, it's the person itself is valuable. So to convince me of the viability of this idea, um, you can take a person-centered approach. You can you can uh, look at this as something that's empathetic, or you can look at this as something that, like I can't believe people are dying. But there's you know that's not something that's that's accessible to everybody. Not everybody feels that way, and not everybody reacts to the world that way. So the example that I gave um, before about let's use a financial frame. Let's say you don't care about people that use drugs in the slightest. Let's say you don't want anything to do with it, but you're concerned about where your tax dollars go. You're concerned that somebody that injects drugs is using the emergency room on a frequent basis, and that's something that's being paid for out of, out of public health dollars. We can prevent that. Um, we can prevent that today, and we can put that money into to programs that actually work to improve you know, your life. And so that's, that's a way of, of translating the issue um, for other people. So thank you, Matt. And I think we have uh, the, the possibility to, to have um, other five minutes. Uh, so I can ask you the last question because uh, when you were talking, uh, um, uh, I was really fascinated by this idea of um, the people that are uh, uh, approaching photojournalism, uh, they want to be as close as they can to to something, to the situation. And I'm not a photojournalist, but I think that it's the same over to me as a story designer. Uh, so uh, what I really enjoy in my work and in my research is the opportunity and the possibility to work uh, with people in order to uh, listen stories and try to co-create stories uh, with them. And because stories are really uh, 
capable of uh, creating, as uh, we, we, we are discussing, uh, um, about new frame of reference, uh, about uh, several issues. Also, issues that are uh, uh, tough and uh, stigmatized, as, for example, uh, drug addiction uh, or, for example, uh, inmates and so on. Uh, so, uh, um, going uh, back for one moment, uh, talking about the design practice, uh, how do you think that as uh, photojournalists or storytellers or uh, story designers, uh, we can recognize and also overcome our biases in uh, when we listen story and we need to construct and create and spread these stories to our people, to other people? I mean, that's a tough question. If we had the answer to that, we would, I think we might be in a different world right now. But I can, I can speak, I can speak about my own um, practice and see if it gets somewhere. I, I think that you know, as storytellers, we have an obligation to take people seriously, uh, which is, you know, for me, I, I, the the part of my brain that's an attorney, I don't like to. Right, I, I'm 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 very comfortable judging people. I'm very comfortable jumping to conclusions, uh, and so in in my real life, you know, this is a challenge for me. Uh, in my fake life, in my practice life, <laughs> in in my professional life, um, it's a little bit easier because it's because I can be I can be focused only on that question. Uh, which is to say, if I think about it as a left brain, right brain thing, I, I really want to shut down my left brain when I'm listening to somebody. I want to I want to shut down the piece that's analyzing or trying to get two steps ahead of them so that I can understand where they're coming from and what their frame is. And I think that that's really important um, for storytellers uh, you know, as, as they're working. And incidentally, once you've done that practice, this is the thing that I, I think... Um, I think is missing from a lot of a lot of uh, you know work that's produced around issues that are difficult. Once you're done with that, then it's time to re-engage with your left brain. Then it's time to really start asking those questions, which is okay. I understand where this is coming from, but what are the consequences um, of of what I'm about to do? You know, if 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 I publicize something in a particular way, do I make it more appealing? Do I make it more dangerous? Do I force it underground? When it comes to drug use, uh, a, a friend of mine um, who's a program director with a harm reduction organization uh, says something really nice, and I think it's it's a it's a, it's a good way to to close the conversation here. She says that when you force things underground, when you make things dangerous, when you make things other or you make things scary, you, you really do make them truly dangerous because nobody can see them. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm a little bit sad that our time is finished for now, but I want to really thank you, you, Matt, and also Kevin for uh, giving us the opportunity to know Matt. So. Thank you very much.